Rasik Vega Bas Yehuda, Ilu Nishmas Abi Mari Zev Ben Eliyahu Yosef, and Rufu Shlema from Moshe Ben Chana. Amen. Ilu Nishmas, my father in law, Shmuel Ephraim Ben Naftali, Arav Naftali Yitzchak. We are here to uh, speak about Asar Bateves. Okay? Uh, we are going to identify the basic, the most basic question that has to arise, and not a question about Jewish history, Jewish philosophy, about human nature. The question that has to arise when we understand what we are commemorating on Asar Bateves. So, guess how long after the events of Asara B'tevet, which means when they actually put the siege around the walls of Yerushalayim, how long did it take for them to breach the walls and enter Yerushalayim in order to obviously conquer it and then wreak all the terrible, terrible destruction, pain, and misery that they were able to perpetrate upon us? Two and a half years. Two and a half years. Thirty months. So why are we celebrating the day that they put the siege around the walls? What is so significant about that? That's our question. Nothing happened for 30 months. The real disaster was when they broke through. Why do we commemorate this with a fast? In other words, it's a really sad day. And by the way, Asar B'tevet is so significant that theoretically you would have to fast on Shabbos for it. And it could actually even fall on Fridays, which is very unusual. What's so significant about Asar B'tevet? And we have to get to an, a point here, an aspect that we're going to explore about human nature, something that we are being kind of shown in our faces, and we're, be, we're, we're recognizing it and we're facing it as a, as a problem, and that's why we're fasting. And that is that um, for 30 months, they were under threat, but they were not yet under attack on that level, not physically. They weren't in the city yet. In other words, for 30 months, the disaster could have been averted. In other words, there were warning signs, danger was looming, but there, was, there were options. There always are options. And what happened? Things progressed in a natural state. And the, the siege became eventually, you know, a full frontal attack. They broke through and eventually led to the Horban. What we're talking about is this. What, what in human nature, okay, encourages us, it doesn't just allow us, it pushes us to become complacent even when danger is looming, when there's an urgency, when something needs to be done, and when we need to do it for our own existence, for our own survival, this is either on a national level, community level, even personal level. However, we opt for complacency, tell ourselves stories that it'll be okay and we'll find a better solution. We don't have to take severe action and it will pass. And it's okay for just one more day like this. Tomorrow I'll figure out what to do about it. And we allow ourselves to be lulled into complacency, telling ourselves nice reasons why it's okay. What is it in human nature that causes us to have this inertia, this lack of initiative? And Perak 42, among many other places in Yeshayahu, mentions this, speaks of this. Hashem says in the end of 42 regarding the impending doom, the impending Horban, He says to them, um, Look what I did. I poured this wrath upon you, and I made it really clear to you that things were not going well, right? Uh, he poured, Yeshayahu was saying, he made himself seem so angry to you, right? The Ezuz Milchama, and the strength of war was all around you. And he burned fires everywhere around you. He made you right, urgent, dangerous uh, situations. And he caused even more fire to burn. But you just didn't take it to heart. What is that? We're going to explore inertia, lack of action, lack of motivation, laziness or rationalizations, complacency. We don't have to look that far back in history, back to Europe, where masses of Jews became complacent. They let, don't go, it's better to say it'll blow over, stay in Europe. There are, the dangers of leaving are even greater than the dangers of staying. Don't go to America, you'll just be destroyed there. Better to stay here. 
My father-in-law's father, Harav Naftali Yitzchak Wien, was in 1929. He's one of the few, right? These are the unique stories, but these are the people that survived. He was in, in 1929, he was in Poland between the First and Second World War, and he read the newspaper. He read the newspaper, and he was smart, and he said, this is not going to, this is not, this is not going to last. This, this whole thing is going to blow up. Germany will never accept its defeat in the First World War. We need to get out of Europe. And nobody, everyone thought he was wrong, and they told him, don't talk like that, and don't disturb the family, and don't drive everyone crazy. He had an uncle in America who was able to send him an affidavit. He got his family out of Poland in 1929. And when he wrote letters back to the remaining family, they were upset at him. Don't disturb us with this stuff. We're not coming to America. You're, you'll see your whole family won't be religious or whatever. Right? But that wasn't how the story ended. And, uh, and he took action when so many people didn't take action. Even in Germany, in 1936, my grandfather was a little fortunate. They, they, they harassed the rabbinim first, earlier on. They went after the, lead, the rabbis. So he was already being harassed by the Nazis in the third, in 34 and in 35. So he knew he had to get out. He went to Israel to find a shtela to see if he could get hired in a community. He went to South America, to Brazil, then eventually came to America, and he was hired by a community in Baltimore. But as he was leaving, in 1936, he was leaving his rabbanus, his position, in a town in Germany called Ischenhausen. And a young rabbi who was hoping to get the job that he was vacating, you know, came and asked him to write a letter of recommendation. My grandfather said, don't stay here. You know, don't be, you know, this is a new opportunity, a new shtela, a new community. He said, you need to leave. No, it's going to, it won't be, the world won't let it, it won't it'll blow over, all whatever rationalizations that were comfortable to tell ourselves, and obviously he didn't uh, make it. And um, so the question is, some people take action, and most people don't, and even in other areas of our life, even people that might take action, in one area won't necessarily, well, you know, aren't always going to take action every area. Look at, look at simple explanations, simple examples, right? Simple examples. I really shouldn't be eating like this. It's really making me sick. I'm getting fatter and fatter, right? <laughs> I'm, I have less and less energy. But we don't stop, right? I really should walk more or exercise more, but, but tomorrow I will. But today it's raining. But I, my head hurts. It, and, you know, we put it off or we make excuses. What is it? So we know that it exists. It's a natural phenomenon. It has different names. In Mesila Sisharim, who has an entire chapter about this, it's called Atlas, laziness. But before we go into the Mesila Sisharim, in modern language, Freud identified this. Freud identified the two major forces that drive or un lack of, you know, that drive or don't drive a human being. Anybody know what they are? It's the, it's the two forces. The defenses. The, well, with the motivational forces. We have the libido, which, the, which is, he, he sees as a source of all action and motivation. But what we're going to talk about today is what he calls the death wish. Oh. The death wish doesn't mean suicide per se, but it's, that's the ultimate expression of it. The death, death, wish, death wish is inertia, where a person will not act will be passive in the face of either imminent or not imminent damage or danger, depression, the extremely gratifying emotion of self-pity, which is so satisfying. So woe is me and look how terrible it is, right? The um, emotional paralysis, physical, not, not physical, emotional, intellectual, I can't, there's nothing I can do about it, I'm helpless, I'm a victim. It's too much for me. I'm out of control, right? All of these type of self messages, narratives we tell ourselves that create a passivity, a, 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 a um, lack of action, a paralysis, lack of taking control, lack of self-assertion, lack of going out and contributing or doing something or making a change. It's a very powerful human force. In fact, the first law of thermodynamics, 
we probably learned that back in the day is the law of inertia, right? An object will remain at rest unless acted upon, hello, <laughs> by an outside force. Okay? Right? Everybody remembers that? A ball will stay where it is unless somebody kicks it. The, now, there's a positive side to this. Hashem just didn't create us with this heaviness and this natural tendency to stay put and not take action because Hashem made us by nature lazy. No, there's a natural tendency in a person that balances off their desire to act and to achieve and to get things done and to achieve things for them, their own selves. The, the, the balance is action, kum say, get up and do something, but there's also a value to shev va'al tase, just don't do anything. Stay as it is and don't, right now, just, you know, keep, keep the status quo. For example, we see in a week ago's parsha, pretty much, vayeshev Yaakov. What is that? Bikesh Yaakov lashevet b'shalva. He wanted just to root himself down in peace, raise his family, and not, again, engage in outside battles with Esav and with Lavan and with Shem and all these outside forces that he contend with. He just wanted to focus, my grandfather of Schwab says, on raising his family, putting all his energies, consolidating everything into the chinuch of his own family. But the Jewish reality is that's not really always our privilege. Now, Yosef, Paro, Mitzrayim, so much being out there and all kinds of other things. The Jewish people through our thousands of years of Gullahs have not had the privilege, so to speak, or the opportunity to just root ourselves down and develop any type of real inertia. We're always uprooted and we're always moving. And in Yeshayahu in Perak 42, which we're not going to talk about today, it, they find the very, very, just to allude to, just to mention it, the very classic famous Pasuk, which is Hashem Chafetz Laman Sidko Yagdil Torah Yadir. In the context of Perak 42, Membez, why the Jewish people had to be running and in gullus and in darkness and under persecution and under stress and never have peace, it was to cause Torah to grow and expand. That somehow when we're on the move and we're Everything else around us is not comfortable, and we're not allowed to be settled, and we can't deteriorate into becoming interested in pleasures and gratification and ease. When we're always on the move, somehow that stimulates our mind and our hearts to find whatever peace of mind or serenity or inertia we can muster or a sense of rootedness has to come from in ourselves. So even if we're on the run, Torah and Chedushim and Torah, the Rambam, Rashi, Tosos, this all came from the worst, bleakest, dreariest times in Jewish history, where the writers themselves, the authors themselves, were on the run, or always persecuted, always moving. But you look and see, you need to have a certain sense of serenity, peace, rootedness. Where do you find it? You find it in your Torah, that's in your head and in your heart, that you carry with you, that you think about, that you write about. For posterity, it comes, that's where our inertia was. Whatever peace of mind we had was in ourselves. It wasn't externally provided for us at all. But there's a natural need in a person, right, to have that sense of, um, of kind of centeredness or rootedness, wherever you find it from. The Jews find it inside ourselves. Others find it from outside, and we already know, look at America, look at our American children, just compare them to Israeli kids that don't have as much luxury and ease and comfort, and especially Israeli kids who know that, you know, the non-religious kids, let's say, who know that absolutely without a question that they're going in the army and they're gonna, they're gonna kill themselves in there and they're gonna put their life on the line. It's not about, there's no expectation of total ease, indefinitely. Our kids, who do have this underlying expectation of indefinite, any forever ease in all areas, we suffer from that. We suffer from lack of achievement from that. We suffer from lack of motivation from that, right? So um, the story is that it is a human condition. That's number one. You call it the death, death wish, or you call it atzlos, laziness, rootedness, inertia. It's necessary in a balance. Okay, what's the proper balance? Masil Sisharm sets it up. 
Everyone knows what Masil Sashram is, right? It's a guidebook, step-by-step -step guidebook to human perfection, which really, if you go by the Ramchal, will lead you right into Ruach HaKodesh. Spiritual human perfection. The first Mida that he speaks about is inertia. Zahirus. Be very careful. The first thing you have to be kind of control is the first thing we have to uh, kind of get in order is that there is a place to not act. <coughs> be very cautious. Zahirus is caution not to make a mistake and not to sin. Know the halacha so you don't sin. Right? So you don't do the wrong thing. Know what not to say, what not to do on Shabbos, what not to, how, what actions you're not to take, what you shouldn't be thinking. Know the parameters so you don't transgress them, you don't cross over the boundaries, and you, it's really shave Valta said, don't act. Be zahir, be cautious. Don't jump into something before you know it's permitted and it's in the right place and the right time. Be cautious. That's the first thing. But the next mida that is Im imperative, imperative is zrizus. And what is zrizus? Zrizus is get up and take action. Be enthusiastic. Muster up huge enthusiasm so you do the mitzvah right away. Now, what is enthusiasm? Enthusiasm is, again, like Zahira, sometimes there are, no question, there are people that are more prone to caution, and more pro other people more prone to impulsive action generated by you know, energy, enthusiasm. No question there are personality types. But nevertheless, each person has to work on both of these things to refine them. So in Zerizus, he identifies the fact that many, many people don't have enthusiasm. They're just lazier, he calls them, atzlos. Now, lazy implies, in our language, like a flaw. Okay, and, and it is a personality flaw if we opt for laziness. But let's, before we go for opting for laziness, there is a natural tendency to want to be lazy. The Eitzahara would say, give in to it. Okay? So he brings down here on the bottom, whoever, this is the art school, uh, um, that they, a little story from Revel Yashiv, that he used to get up at 2 a.m. to learn. Now, everybody says stay in bed longer. Everyone tells themselves that. So what did he do? So as soon as he got up, this is what they say, he wasn't there, he would grab his blanket, roll it up in a little ball, and throw it off his bed so he'd be cold. And then he'd get up. Like, you still need strategies to not give in to the laziness. The fact that your body tells you to be lazy, that's normal. The Yitzhar is to act on it. So he writes here that enthusiasm is not self-generating. Now, we know there are people that are either by their virtue of their chemistry, like my father, my sister, <laughs> extremely energetic 100% of the time, okay? And that's part of their, their personality, no question about it. Then there are people that are much more earthbound, so to speak, and slower by their personality. Each person still can be lazy about things they don't want to do, okay? Yeah, the things you're excited about, you got a lot of energy, but there's plenty of the same people don't, are not interested in doing, and uh, that takes motivation. How, he said, motivation in general, if you're excited about what you're going to do, it's not, a, we're not talking about that. But if you're not thrilled about what you're going to do, and it takes a lot of effort, what do you do? It's not, you can't turn on a button and be motivated. So he says that Zerizus, when he's talking about mitzvahs, how do you get really enthusiastic to do a mitzvah as soon as you can with excitement? So you know what his answer is? Not emotional, not spiritual, not psychological. Gurnish. You know what he says? Move your body. Physical movement. He says, physical movement. He says like this. He says this means that when someone energizes, I'm in the elements of Zerizos, chapter 7, that just at, here, this means that when someone energizes himself in his performance of a mitzvah, then just as he quickens his outer physical movement, so too does he cause his inner movement, his enthusiasm, to be fired up within him. This is something that experience can attest, he says, that you, if you start to get physically active, then you will find, you get, you know, you get a burst. And then you're just more, you have more pheromones, we know this from exercise, positive energy, and you're more motivated to do things. And you see the good in things, you get more enthusiastic, you find reasons why it's a good idea to do these things. He says, we have stated, lively external movement of the body inspires a comparable inner enthusiasm of the spirit. 
He doesn't say go to the gym, but he basically says that it is crucial for a person to physically, if they're not, if they're not motivated, because some people are, we'll talk about that in a second, if you're not finding the motivation, certainly for mitzvahs, and, and all our life is one form of a mitzvah or not, everything you say to anybody, any interaction you have with anybody, it's all either Yerushalayim or Avas Hashem, it's all mitzvahs. So to be enthusiastic about it, right, is critical. He says, if you don't find yourself motivated, act, what does he call Lively, external, physical motion. So that would mean, tachlis, practical, if you have X amount of money to spend on making yourself feel good, it's a lot more helpful to spend it on exercise, unless that means, whatever that means, a machine or somebody to come over or a gym or whatever, then on do give indulging yourself with more food or pleasures or whatever it is, or purchases or whatever, that's not going to be the key to enthusiasm. It's not true. What's going to be the key to enthusiasm is action. Now, this is talking about, he's addressing people that don't seem to be able to muster up the enthusiasm. What we want to talk about now is, what about those people that do have tremendous enthusiasm? There are people that are excited, either be about Yeras Shemayim, about mitzvahs, about contributions to the community, to their family, to whatever is going on, to learning. They're full of enthusiasm. Here, what we have to explore now, where does it come from? Where does it come from? And therefore, how is it the antidote to inertia, lack of motivation, excuses, you know, complacency? Where does enthusiasm come from? When, when does a person, when do you have no problem at all thinking of planning ways to like, you know, um, let's say to another person, to please that person. You're going to buy them, you're going to go to that store and get that card, you know they love that kind of cake or whatever, or you're going to do, you know, you're going to get find them that, you know, set, a, you know, book for them that activity. When you love them, when you love a person with that exciting love, you have no problem being enthusiastic. Okay, forget about your kids. We love our kids because that's self-love, because whether they're creepy or good or bad, we love them. We see the good in them, and we can, they're always going to they always have optimism. Okay, That's all a lot of self-love. I'm talking about, I mean, it's all a good thing, Baruch Hashem, built in. What, if, what happens when there's an outside random person that you find yourself crazy about that person? I don't even mean the opposite gender. Somebody you are just enthused about, and you want to do something for them, and you love them. And you just can't stop thinking about what you could do for them. What generates that? How does that happen? Some a, a, a random person who you're not related to is not by virtue of any, you know. Inspired. You're inspired, or what's the word? Respect. Uh, respect. Everyone, respect, admiration. Okay. When you admire someone, give me an example of when you would admire someone so much. It's never in a bubble. It's never because, in theory, they are a very smart person who, um, you know, who gave great lectures. That's not, that's not what motivates a person to go out of their way to please. What is admiration? They, they make you feel good. Sometimes. They make you feel good. Because let's say, so you admire a person because, they make you feel good because, because you admire them because they did something that you directly benefited from. And it's so pleasurable to you, the benefit you got, and it means so much to you, and it's so added a dimension to your life that you can't believe the person was so good, was so giving, was so helpful, was so considerate, right, was so selfless, and you benefited, and now you feel this huge gratitude and love, and in that situation, motivation is, you're done, you're fine. You don't need anybody to give you motivation. It's, you're good to go. You have tons of motivation. What generates motivation is the love that comes from admiration, respect. Gratitude, gratitude, which is admiration. It goes together. Admiration and gratitude. No, no question about it. The love that comes from gratitude. Real gratitude that I personally benefited. And in me, I feel like I can't, I can't reciprocate enough. And when a person feels real gratitude, they will reciprocate generously. They will never be stingy. They'll do it more because giving to that person gives them pleasure. So 
love, the mo when you want to, so these people that are on fire and they're enthusiastic, either they love what they're doing, and if it's another person, they love the other person so much and they're grateful, okay, to the other person. And it's not obligation and it's not I'm giving as an investment because maybe one day there'll be a mensch, <laughs> okay? It's, it's a love that comes from, love that comes from this, you know, this enthusiasm of like, that's, as we said, that leads to a generous, you know, kind of like overflow of reciprocation. So if a person, he's in the Silsa Sharma saying, if a person wants to have that feeling about mitzvahs, so clearly, what do you do? You, he says you can't turn on a switch. He doesn't say it like that, but he says you can't self-generate enthusiasm. Clearly, you have to work on love for Hashem. How do you work on love for Hashem? Clearly, you have to work on gratitude. gratitude. Okay, now that's not so simple. I always felt put off by the following approach to gratitude. And I still do whenever I hear share, you know, people talking like this. You wake up in the morning and you should have so much, you make brachos because you have to thank Hashem that he made you see, you know, there are blind people and that you're not starving, you have food, you know, there are people in Cambodia who are starving. And I thought like, oh, so I'm thanking God because I'm lucky and that guy got messed up and guy, he, he has nothing to thank God for. But I, I'm not blind, I got a lucky draw, I, was, I, was the, I won the lottery and they didn't. It's so unjust, and it's such a wrong reason to be thankful because I did better than that guy. It's crazy, and it makes hush. It's not a good compliment to Hashem. Thank Him because you're lucky. What kind of thing to say about Hashem and His treatment of all humanity? It's not an approach to Kakar Satov. That's right. I don't believe it at all. That's not why we thank Hashem, because I have eyes, and I'm healthy today, and you're not. I think we thank Hashem because that we come to understand, and that's what we're going to get to next, that life is a gift, irregardless of the circumstances. That's why we think of Hashem. I'm alive. I have X amount of years, this very short life here, whether it be 70, 80, 90, or less, half to show years. And in this short time, I'm God, like a God right here on this earth. I'm creator. I have so much I can do. Okay, in this world to make a difference. I matter. Things will be better or improved because of me. And I can express myself freely. And Hashem wants me to, no matter what the situation is. I've been invested by God to do something on His behalf in my way. And if there's going to be any, we spoke about this a lot, kavod shemayim in this world is going to come from us. If there's going to be any R, it's going to come from the inside. Ner Hashem nishmat adam, it's going to come from me. So I'm partners with Hashem, and I have a big job to do, no matter, and I could even do it in Auschwitz, and people did it. Okay, so there's gratitude. People that are enthusiastic all the time have a kara satov to Hashem for living, period, no matter what the situation is. And it's not dependent on whether the situation gets better or worse. I'll never forget the great, holy Rabbi Yisrael Tauber. He's still alive. He's old now. He was though so, so, so wealthy. And he was the most enthusiastic teacher and full of joy and positive energy. And then he lost everything, literally everything. And you couldn't see one bit of difference. Nothing changed. Zero. It was like the same thing. It was like, well, he's a Holocaust survivor. It didn't came and went. He didn't really care too much about it. But just it, had, it wasn't about that at all. And, um, and it was because he was happy to be alive, period. So that's people who have enthusiasm. That's for sure where they're operating from. They're happy to be alive. You never saw a person who's depressed who's got a huge amount of energy, OK? That doesn't really work like that. Positive people are, have a ton of energy, OK? So we're talking about there is a problem. There, we tend towards complacency and inertia and what we call giving in to laziness. Why? Because it's easier. It's easy, and we give ourselves reasons why it's OK to be complacent, even when danger is looming. And it's very, very dangerous, but it's a human condition. And we commemorate Asar Batavis because that was the sin. 30 months of a siege, and they didn't avert the, the disaster. What was that? Right? And, um, and, uh, and yet, on the other hand, there's a way to fix that. There's a way to muster enthusiasm. But let's get even deeper. We return to Kohelas. The reason we get complacent, and the reason we give in to our laziness, and the reason we allow the inertia to hold us back, and we find excuses why we shouldn't push ourselves, even in urgent situations, is because beneath it all, 
we know there's a reality that we cannot escape. And that is, look, we're all going to die. Some people died with more accomplishments, and some died with less accomplishments. And even the people that ran their whole lives and did so much, they are laying in the same graveyard next to the same people that didn't do anything. Okay? And in the end, it's all over. And you can't even control. You can't even control what the people come after you do with your accomplishments. They can squander it. You could leave your kids a big business, and they, they run it into the ground. You can start an organization and it falls apart and breaks up with Machlokas because the next people. Like, so we feel a certain depressive attitude of what's the point, right? Eov started with that, by the way. We're talking about that in the Brooklyn Shear, but he got past that pretty quickly. His friend said, you know, I'll talk like that. But he went into a whole phase in the beginning of like, what's it all worth? And we all end up in the graveyard. But then he moved on to other, other issues. But we have an entire safer devoted exactly to this struggle. What safer is that? Kohelis. Kohelis is entirely about <laughs> this question of the futility of, of action, of taking, of, of accomplishing anything. Because look, look how the safer starts. Hevel, Havolim, Amar, Kohelis, Akol, Hevel. Which we often translate as per pointless, futile, zero. What's the point of anything, right? And we often, if we don't read the Sefer carefully, we believe that the whole Sefer is like that. But hello, why Shlomo Melech is writing an entire Sefer that becomes part of Tanakh that basically says it's, a point, it's pointless, everything comes and goes and nothing lasts, so what's the point and it's all futile? We have a whole Sefer like that? Is that the Jewish attitude? What about Zrizos? What about Simcha? What about uh, trying being a Tel Melechim? Like a whole Sefer saying, what's the point? I tried everything, everything comes, everything goes, there's no point to anything, just do your mitzvahs before you die, and, right? So first of all, that's not, that is how it sounds like Hevel, Hevel, like Kohela starts. But shortly after, he shifts gears, and you find throughout the rest of the Sefer a whole different tone of voice. For example, I'm already in Parakhes here, he says, V'shibachti ani et simcha, I praised Simcha, joy. Asher ein tov la'adam tachat Hashemesh, there's no greater goodness under the sun. Ki im le'echo v'lishtot v'lesmoach, eat, drink, be happy. V'hu yil v'lenu ba'amalo, and this will accompany you and give you comfort when you, in the hard, the days of the hard work, you'll have these good memories. You'll have this basis of joy, okay? In the hard days that come, ba'amalo yimei chayav asher natan lo elokim tachat Hashemesh. And he went on to say, he speaks often about that. Enjoy life. Invest in it. Eat and drink with your wife, with your, the wife of your youth, with, the, with the, your friends, and there's nothing better than it. And that doesn't sound like the hevel, havolim, hakol, hevel. So we need a key. We need a key to unlock the message here in the Sefer. And I think the key is, as pointed out by this professor Eitan Dorshav, that uh, we have to evaluate what the word hevel actually means. Now, interestingly enough, he points out that the original translation of Torah we know is Greek. Greek, the word hevel was translated as vanitas. Vanity. Yeah, but va vanitas in Greece has, Greek has two meanings. One is like vain and, and empty, but the other way vanitas is used in Greek is fleeting. Mm -hmm. Fleeting. Now, let's explore that. We don't have to go very far to try to figure out what Hevel means because we have a character in the Torah called Hevel. Is this a Tanakh? All right, so let's talk about Hevel. What kind of life did he live? Yeah, definitely short. What did he leave after him? Anything? Well, what, but what did he leave in the physical world after him? Children? No. no. A city that he built that has his name on it? Hmm? Okay, so he wasn't so bad. Did he leave a city? No. No. Did he leave children? No. Okay. So no footprint. Zero. He dies young. Nothing. Okay? But, however, regarding his offering to Hashem, the Pasuk says here, we're in Perak Dalid, Pasuk Hey. Okay, Pasuk Dalid. Vayisha Hashem el Hevel ve el Minchaso. And Hashem Vayisha, Vav Yud Shin Ayin. So what is it called? What's that word? That root? 
Yeshua, which means what? Was redemption. Redemption. Delivered. Delivered. He was delivered. Delivered from what? Delivered from? The rest of the Pasuk. El Hevel Vel Minchato. Delivered. Like Vayosha Hashem is Yisrael Miad Mitzrayim. Delivered from the trap that will drag you into it and destroy you. Hevel has a very short life. However, he is unique so far in all the cre characters we've met since the creation story. He's the first person that Hashem loves and doesn't punish and doesn't chastise. Loves meaning loves what he's done. He's the first person that Hashem gives credit that he did it right. He's the first person that shows gratitude. He is the first, well, in the Pasuk, he, should give, should, does, he the car, we know. So we know from the fact that Vayisha Hashem el Hevel, that Hashem delivered Hevel from the trap that the, first, uh, the other three have already fallen into, the human trap that Adam, Isha, and Isha fell into of subjectivity, and Cain fell into of possessiveness and competition and, and, uh, and um, jealousy and all the other negative things. One, the, the, the sin of Adam and Chav is to want everything, and the sin of Cain is to be selfish, right, and not to want to have anything other split. Um, he's the first one who succeeds. His life is a credit. He did it right. Now, how do we know that he did it right? The proof is not just that it says, Vayisha Hashem El Hevel V'Nuchasa, which is the first time we see the word Vayisha used that he delivered him from all the, put, the, 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 the pitfalls. And he succeeded in his life in at least creating a relationship with Hashem based on a Kara Satov, true connection, which Hashem appreciated. The very last words that Moshe Rabbeinu uttered from his mouth to Am Yisrael at the end of the Torah is the following. Ashrecha Yisrael. Fortunate are you, Israel. Mi kamocha, who could be compared to you? Am nosha bahashem. A nation delivered by your trust in Hashem, by your connection to Hashem. The highest praise, the greatest statement of good fortune is you succeeded through your attachment to Torah to become an am delivered by your connection to Hashem. You are delivered from the pitfalls that will that will dr drag all of humanity down and, and cause them to, in a sense, misuse their lives. You are not, you're not in danger of that. That's Moshe's last <laughs> words. It's the highest compliment. So Hevel is a person who got it right, who is beloved, who is successful. However, at the same time, Hevel's life was sure. fleeting. The word Hevel in Kohelis means quick, quickly passing, fleeting, it doesn't last long, which does not mean that it's therefore inconsequential, has no purpose, no use investing in it, depressing, waste of what's the point, it doesn't mean any of those things, it means, Shlomo is saying, because it's quick, because it goes by fast, which in the beginning of the Sefer, he says, that thought will cause you to say, it goes by so fast, what's the point? Everything passes, everything comes and goes, even great moments of achievement, they also go by quickly. Okay, so the disastrous moments also pass, the Holocaust ended, and things got better, but the good things also pass. Everything passes, so what's the point of investing? So it says, no, it does go by fast, granted, but that cannot be a reason to be depressed, become lazy, not have his resource, not in, it's muster up enthusiasm, not be excited about the, what you can do at the moment you have. Enjoy it, invest in it, make the most of it, because it goes by so fast. So don't waste a minute. That's really the message of Kohelis. Optimism, despite the fact that we're very conscious of the fleetingness, the fleeting character of life. So to wrap this all up, and to wrap this up, is it common and natural and kind of like our default mode to become complacent, to give ourselves reasons not to muster up enthusiasm, to say what's the point, whatever will happen will happen anyway, 
Okay, so if I get if I if I don't protect myself and I don't know how to fight and I don't carry pepper spray and I don't do anything and I don't look around when I'm walking and somebody attacks me, so it probably was Bashir. No, right? So you do what you can do. It doesn't mean you can do whatever you everything that you'd like to do, but you certainly try to you know do take the action that you could take to the best of your ability, and never ever allow yourself to fall into the trap of this, of this um, inertia, this atlas. I think that Sarbateves is commemorated because, you know, this is this capacity to let things just kind of unfold, even if we, have a, we know it's going to be bad, is something that we are being cautioned never to let ourselves do. And the truth is, in Gullus, as a nation, we weren't even allowed to ever get too complacent. And, and too, you know, kind of um, rooted. And as we said before, when we do get rooted, the results are not so great. We get, you know, when nothing's driving us to act, to take action, we become very, not just lazy, we become very, um, you know, pleasure-oriented and gratification-oriented and expect everything to be easy all the time and get annoyed when it isn't. Now, what happens, and this is what we're going to end with, so let's say your life, Baruch Hashem, for the moment is peaceful and nothing is demanding, like you take urgent action and dramatic action, and things are easy, and things are pleasurable, and there's not so much effort involved to do the right things and have a nice life. So then what do you do? Where does Rezus come in? It's dangerous to live like that. It's dangerous for ourselves spiritually. It is a drug. Masil Sharm says, slow, it doesn't happen right away, but slowly, but surely, just the ruin comes on a person, little by little, little by little, until you're cut put. It's like a drug that, that anesthetizes us, slowly but surely. So what do you do for that? Should we take it to the next level? Try to improve. If you, if there's always room to grow. For future. If nothing in your life demands urgent action, so you go out and you look for something to throw yourself into that does demand urgent action. You go find a need that's urgent and that calls for enthusiasm and motivation and you take a highest to fill that need. Right? That's what you do. You look for something that needs you and that you could play an important role. You go find a significant mitzvah to do. A, a, a need to fill, a void that to fill in your community, in your family members, in Am Yisrael. And then you get excited about your ability to make a difference in that way, and then you muster up the enthusiasm because you're grateful that you have what it takes to make a difference in this area for this person or this situation. You create this visas. The main thing is avoid the Yitzhahara of complacency like, like oh, the plague, like the plague. It will destroy you. It will destroy us. It does destroy us. Look at people. You see people that literally physically, physically destroy themselves by not taking control. And also people that never feel that they have no purpose and don't go out and find a purpose or it's hard for them to find a purpose. They don't want to live. No. They don't want to live. <clears throat> right? So, Bezrat Hashem, this is... Um, but meaning. Hmm? Uh, it gives a person meaning when a person has something to that something that cause that needs them. Mm-hmm. And there's always people in It kind of reminds me of since last week was Yosef interpreting Paro's dreams. Kind of have that concept. Holds on to the, the fat years because you're gonna need them in the in the years mm-hmm. that aren't. But also take action. Yosef said take yes, action. Exactly. Don't sit here and let it happen. If you see facts they're not, they're not determining realities. They don't, they're not, nothing. Yosef told Paro, it's just a fact. It is not a, it's not any type of message that this is inevitable and it's, it will happen. It's just information and you do what you want with it. Right? All right, everyone, have a wonderful week.